Hello everybody. So this is our forest history and policy lecture for introduction to forestry. So uh, we'll start off by talking about the historical use of the forest. So the forest is, um, had long been a, um, a natural resource that has provided great amounts to people. As you can see in these, uh, in these photos. The biggest things to think about are just the ideas of uh, the different uses of wood in um, terms of home, in terms of the home, so building materials for the house, um, fencing materials, fuel. Fuel is uh, still the most popular use of wood. The idea of burning wood for warmth is still the most popular use for wood um, coming out of the forest. It also, um, the forest was also a provi um, provided uh, food and clothing because we define the forest as the trees and everything below them. So the wildlife that's in there um, was used for food and clothing. And then also that's where you got your, um, your clean water because you had your, your streams and where there's water, you get trees. So the, the forest was um, a great source of use for for people um, kind of um, working their way through colonial America. They also really helped build and shape uh, America. They were, um, it's an interesting juxtaposition that forests were both in the way, um, but also in demand. So you, the, this idea that we want to build America, we want to have westward expansion, we want to um, see all that this land has to offer, but in doing that, um, we ended up going through a period of um, both great nation building, but also a period of great exploitation. Um, and so you got you got a really underutilized resource. So there was lots of waste. Um, you're cutting down these big, huge trees that have been growing for hundreds of years, and um, in some of these areas, you just had this cutting get out approach here. Let me cut down everything I can in this area. I'll use what I need. We'll burn off the rest or just get rid of it. And I mean, for, for the time, and that's, that's the hard part to understand is that for the time, it's actually a, a good use. Um, they didn't, they didn't feel like they were wasting anything. They didn't understand what the problem was. But when we look at back at it now, they there was so much waste that could have been so much more of a better use. Um, and then there's also the idea of the, uh, the railroads coming in and the use of the forest to help build the railroads. And um, right away, um, once, once this kind of idea of building America comes in, we start getting into this issue of who owns this land and, and how should it... How should we figure that out? And so that that becomes a real interesting um, interesting detail in terms of forest history. In terms of here in California, it's slightly different. Um, the the uh, Europeans weren't here for a long time, so we have a um, long Native American uh, tradition of the Native Americans as land managers using um, fire to stimulate growth. Uh, creating a mosaic for wildlife, destroying diseases, having easier pathways to and from, or uh, or um, easier um, places to hunt. Um, and we know this because uh, we can look at a species like California black oak. And when we look at the history of California black oak, and we and we look at the ecology of California black oak, and we understand how it comes to be, we start to say, well, read it. Well, you know, like, how can we prove that Native Americans did this? And how do, can we prove they did it on purpose? When you see something like Black Oak, Black Oak wouldn't exist if there wasn't these practices. It's been proven um, with the idea that um, the way that, that Black Oak um, comes in and stays and the amount that we have without these um, burning cultural burning practices we black oak wouldn't exist um, in the amounts that it does and in the places that it does today um, the the Native Americans in this area they um, 
they really were land managers. I mean, they sowed seeds, they transplanted seeds, they pruned and weeded, they constructed ditches and diverted water. They really, um, they lived off the land, so they really did their best to use the land. Um, and so for for the Europeans and for the, the settlers moving west, um, California was seen as vast, untouched wilderness, but really... The idea of what they saw when they first showed up was a land that was being managed um, by by people. So, um, just kind of there. There's a lot of history to forestry in the United States, so let's just kind of summarize some stuff and um, kind of go give you hopefully a really good big picture to the to the process. So the first uh, sawmill in the U.S. was in uh, 1623 uh, in York, Maine. Um, the You get to about the 1700s and really a lot of forestry revolves around wooden shipbuilding. So Florida becomes a really important place because um, that's where you have live oak. And live oak was, is a hardwood tree that was used um, for, for shipbuilding and really was an important tree to the U.S. Navy. And basically, the back in the 1700s in the, the Revolutionary War period, you had wooden ships, and um, the U.S. Navy was, was all wooden ships, and their preferred species was... Um, live oak down on the Florida Gulf Coast. So uh, you start in the late 1700s, you start getting um, these laws enacted to protect uh, this area because of its importance to the U.S. Navy. Uh, in the 1800s, you get both wood-burning locomotives and then you also get uh, westward expansion and agricultural expansion. So there's now access to the west, access to other forests. You need wood to both help create the tracks and burn uh, the through the engines and so uh, forests just still prove to be extremely important important during these colonial times. So, um, in terms of renewable policy, now we now we get to the eighteen hundreds and um, we start we're starting to think about. Um, policy more and trying to put into perspective what we want to have happen. So there's three main ideas in this 50 year period of the of the mid 1800s, mid to late 1800s. And that's the idea that national sovereignty would be bolstered through settlement. So the idea that we could become this great nation if we spread out and settled in all these different places. Um, another big idea was that government subsidies for internal improvements in education and ag. So you had the Morrill Act. And the Morrill Act is important because um, it is, in 1862, it established land-grant universities. So um, the whole University of California system, that's a land-grant university system. So basically, the Morrill Act had the... Um, the government basically had these lands available and what they decided was that they would give it um, to universities and say here you can go to this area and um, you put a university there put a research station with that university and that way we have all these different universities in these different places but they're also doing research to be able to provide us information on on agriculture and natural resources and how to how to better use these things. So the UC system, um, lots of big research universities. So um, Penn State, University of Florida, University of Georgia, Mississippi State, um, all sorts of, there's lots of them, too many of them to, to name, Michigan State. Um, all these places uh, are all land-grant universities and all came about due to the Morrill Act. A third big idea uh, in this period was that natural resources should be private ownership and managed without government intervention. The problem with that is that um, all of a sudden now uh, the government started handing out 
all this land and people it it ended up um it was given to a bunch of different people but then some of the the bigger companies and industries started saying well what if i buy land from this person and what if i buy it from this person and what if i buy it from that person then all of a sudden all this land that was divvied up to people now actually ended up in just uh hands of a few owners and few big mining companies and timber companies and all of a sudden that's that wasn't what the government was looking for um they had they had a good idea um they had their idea actually um with what we've talked about in the previous lecture is kind of um what it is uh what they were looking for is what what exists today which is that the majority of land is in private ownership but it's in non-industrial private forest landowners it's not in the um in the hands of you know just a few companies so um what so with those three main ideas why why would things change or why would we look to do anything differently so then a little bit of history in the late 1800s we had a large wildfire um sweep through parts of uh, parts of the country that that was called the pestigo fire um started off in the uh great lakes area i think in wisconsin it was 2400 square miles and 1200 people died in this wildfire um you also have in 1872 um Two million acres became Yellowstone National Park, so we started, we have the start of our national park system. And so with this idea that we want to protect some of these resources, with this idea of this huge wildfire that was so problematic and so many people died, the government starts saying, well, now maybe we need to hold on to some of these lands and maybe we need to reevaluate the way we, we manage these lands. So, national parks. So the first uh, state park and uh, protected wilderness area was actually here in California. It was Yosemite Grant, which would later in 1890 become Yosemite National Park, but it started off as a state park first. And it was Yosemite Grant because it was named after um, President Grant. Um, during, uh, during 1872, that's when we got our first uh, national Park, and that was that was Yellowstone National Park. And here's a here's a quote: "The headwaters of the Yellowstone River is hereby reserved and withdrawn from settlement, occupancy, or sale, and dedicated and set apart as a public park or pleasuring ground for the benefit and enjoyment of the people." So the idea behind national parks were not only to um, to set them aside as the public park for the enjoyment of the benefit of the people, but that the, the headwaters of the Yellowstone River needed to be protected. So as um, westward expansion was happening, as we were moving out west, people started to realize how important water was and how much of a limit, limiting factor it is, being that it's the one thing uh, human beings need to survive. And so the idea that of basic uh, ecological understanding that trees grow where water is, and then saying, okay, well, we want these waters to be pristine and perfect. So that means that the area around them needs to stay pristine and perfect. So we need to protect these areas. That's how we get the idea of national parks. So water is always one of these things that is tied to forestry and is extremely important when we think about the idea of forestry. So... Now that we've decided that private ownership isn't totally the right way to go, how do we, what do we do with all these lands and how do we get, um, how do we figure this whole thing out? How do we come up with a large public policy? And so now in this, this era, the late 1800s, as we're coming up with national parks and all these other ideas, we've got the emergence of um, forestry and conservation in the public policy. So Dr. Um, Franklin Huff, he writes uh, on the duty of governments in the retention of forests, and it, um, it's focused on the idea of the, uh, protecting the water. And so he's the one who's kind of 
he's he he wasn't um, trained in forestry. He was a doctor, and um, he just he understood the basic ecology behind the idea that where the water is, that's where the trees are. Um, he does though because of because of writing this and coming up with these ideas in 1881, he becomes the first chief in the Division of Forestry in the United States Department of Agriculture. And he wrote the first text um, called Elements of Forestry in 1882. Um, during this period of time, we also get some environmental advocacy groups. So we get the American Forestry Association, we get the Audubon Society, and we get the Boone and Crockett Club. So they're out there trying to, trying to protect these areas and trying to uh, insert themselves into the, the policy conversation. So um, we're gonna we're gonna talk about um, some different laws, and so the first law that we're gonna focus on is the Forest Reserve Act, and that was in 1891. So it added to national parks and monuments that were already in existence. It gave the president ability to reserve um, public timber and forest growth lands, and it slowed uh, the sales of public lands. So Benjamin Harrison was president at this time. And he reserved two and a half million acres in uh, Wyoming and Colorado as forest reserves. So he didn't want um, this. This is the beginning of that turn that um, the idea that there was we had all this land and then we were going to give it out to the people. Then the um, companies, the big the big companies got to start buying up all that land so it was in the few hands of the people. So now the government's like, well, we're going to hold back some land now. We're going to just reserve um, this land. And then um, eventually that led to about 13 million acres of reserves. And this is the start of um, national forest as we know them today, is this, this um, Forest Reserve Act and the idea that we're just going to hold back these lands and we're not just going to sell them off to the public just because we're trying to move out west. Um, later on during this time, um, Bernard Furneaux, um, he is now the Division of Forestry Chief and he has President Grover Cleveland reserve 21 million um, more acres. So now we're up to 34 million acres of of national forest and that and now we've got uh, the forest reserve organic act of 1897 so the forest reserve organic act of 1897 now gets a little more specific with um, the management side of it so uh, the making of rules and regulations by the secretary of interior so um, it's for use and occupancy of the reserves uh, how to do surveying and inventory of these reserves, and what sort of presidential modifications can be done to these reserves. Uh, you've got the creation of these reserves for producing timber and protecting water only. So that's the, you, they either, to be in these reserves, they had to be a big timber um, producer or they had to be able to um, protect water. Um, also talked about the sale of mature timber at market value and free use of timber by miners and settlers in the area. So um, giving pe allowing people to come into this area and they can use it, but they can't um, sell it or um, big industry can't come, can't come into these areas. And also um, set the way for protection of these reserves from fire and trespassing. And But the biggest thing about the Forest Reserve Organic Act is that it provided the framework for how national forests are managed today. Um, the last thing we'll talk about in this uh, lecture is the National Forest Management Act of 1976. So the Forest Reserve Organic Act set the rules for how, how this, um, these areas were to be managed all the way until 1976 is when we when we changed the uh the rules so a long time of um of this style of management so now we get the early 1900s and we get the antiquities act um, which i've always found to be uh, an interesting um, law 
So uh, in the early 1900s, uh, in the southwestern uh, U.S., they had problems controlling access to these Native American sites and that people were just going in there and looting and taking whatever they wanted um, in terms of cultural artifacts from these areas and just going into these areas. And um, people wanted to preserve these areas. People wanted to, to preserve the Native American heritage of our country. And so the Antiquities Act gave the president administrative power to set aside areas containing objects of cultural or scientific interest and um, set them up as preservation areas. So not areas to be um, used, but areas to be set aside um, for their for their aesthetics or for their cultural or scientific interests. And so kind of um, the way the National Park Service describes it is that the Antiquities Act obligates federal agencies that manage the public lands to preserve for present and future generations the historic, scientific, commemorative, and cultural values of the archaeological and historic sites and structures on these lands. It also, also authorizes the president to protect landmark structures and objects of historic or scientific interest by designating them as national monuments. So if... Um, if you uh, visit a national monument, it's something that's been set aside by the Antiquities Act. Um, there are a lot of different national monuments out there. So some of these ended up eventually being um, national parks, but they started off as national monuments. So the Grand Canyon started off um, as a national monument using the Antiquities Act. Joshua Tree National Park, same thing, Acadia National Park, that all of those um, were some of the early national monuments that eventually became national parks. Uh, the One of the most controversial ones lately was uh, the Bears Ears National Monument that was um, signed off by President Obama and then um, was uh, reduced by the Trump administration. And so it's the Antiquities Act is very interesting in in the way that uh, it gives the president power to um, to set aside these areas and and make the determinations of these areas um, and because it's all focused around cultural and scientific interest it's very um, the law is very flexible. I think in my mind. Now, I'm not a lawyer, and I'm not one of the people um, arguing for or against uh, some of these things, but I think it's just very interesting um, that the president is given kind of a, a real a real big authority to, to designate something, to decide that something is of um, cultural or scientific interest and how much of it is um, in an area is um, part of that cultural or scientific interest. It's it's interesting to me. So now that we get to the early 1900s, that takes us to um, Gifford Pinchot, who is uh, an extremely important person in terms of forestry. And in fact, I mean, um, I would consider him the father of forestry in the United States. Um, he's the he is somebody who worked under Bernard Furneaux. Uh, Furneaux basically told him to go study in France, learn about forestry, um, because um, since Europe uh, had been established for so long, um, France and Germany, these places had been uh, dealing with forestry and forestry issues for a long time. So they um, had systems in place to study forestry and, and thoughts and ideas on it. Um, so... Pinchot goes, um, studies in France, gets um, some different resource experience by managing the Vanderbilt Biltmore Forest Estate. So this is in the North Carolina area. The Vanderbilts were an extremely um, rich um, family in, in the United States and had this huge forest estate. Um, and so he he was managing that this large property, which now um, has become known as the Cradle of Forestry. So we had uh, the very first slide uh, 
that this lecture starts off with. It's the overlook of the cradle of forestry, and that was all part of the, the built more forest estate at one point in time. Uh, he also worked on the National Forestry Commission, Commission and the National Academy of Sciences uh, in the uh, Theodore Roosevelt administration, and he also traveled through the West to identify future forest reserves. So he's one of the people going out to the West and figuring out which of these areas are important and which of them um, aren't as important. So eventually, Pinchot uh, succeeds Furneaux at the Division of Forestry, um, but uh, one of the he starts making some uh, changes or has some ideas. So uh, currently, the forest reserves at this point in time are in the Department of Interior with national parks. Um, and he he starts coming up with the idea that uh, that they should be separate and they should be looked at uh, in a different way. And we're going to talk about that in uh, just a few slides. Uh, Pinchot also establishes the Society of American Foresters, which uh, we talked about in the um, previous lecture as being... Um, the professional organization associated with forestry and um, when he established the society he had two aims he wanted to advance the forestry profession but he also wanted to keep the growing number of professional foresters informed um, regarding ideas and developments within forestry so he wanted to um, make sure that the forestry profession could advance but also make sure that the science and information was getting out there to all the people doing the forestry work and so um, with this idea that um, parks and forests should be separate, we have the Transfer Act of 1905. So forest reserves will then move to the U.S. Department of Agriculture. And um, what was interesting about this whole situation is that the um, professional foresters, so um, Pinchot and Furneaux and these guys, they were working under the USDA. They were working for the Department of Agriculture. But the forest reserves that they were managing were in the Department of the Interior. And Pinchot, after you know studying and coming up with these ideas, says, well, this doesn't make any sense. If we're managing these areas, uh, why don't we move them uh, under the Department of Agriculture? And this becomes important, too, in my mind, because this is where you start to get... Uh, the separation in management philosophies between preservation and conservation. And we're going to talk about that um, really in detail in a, in a few more slides. But, but there's a, a difference between preservation and conservation. And this move to the Department of Agriculture really helps separate uh, the way national forests should be managed as opposed to national parks. So... Um, during this time, also, uh, the Division of Forestry uh, goes to and becomes the Bureau of Forestry and then eventually settles on the name of the United States Forest Service with Pinchot as the first chief of the Forest Service. Um, the big thing with this Transfer Act is the uh, unity of command. So it, uh, sh it strengthened the legal foundation for managing federal forests um, it allowed uh, Pinchot to pick supervisors of the National Forest and then forest rangers, and we start to have this kind of uh, management structure within the National Forest. And then um, they really, this was um, set up and all this was done to really start providing prote uh, protective regulations in the West because now that you've got all this land and we've got this westward expansion, now we really want to make sure since the government's going to be holding on to this land, that we come up with a plan to manage it the best way possible. And so um, this phrase has always been attributed as the kind of the driving force behind the conservation ideas of the U.S. Forest Service, of Gifford Pinchot, of just forestry in general is the greatest good for the greatest number in the long run. And there's a, um, a link to a Forest Service video um, that you should watch right here. It kind of gives an idea of the history of the, of the Forest Service, but also um, the ideas of Pinchot and this, uh, this motto.
So we talked about the um, Biltmore Estate, but um, one of the reasons the Biltmore Estate ended up becoming the Cradle of Forestry is because upon the Biltmore Estate then became uh, the Biltmore School of Forestry. So the Biltmore Forestry School was the first school of forestry in North America, and it was patterned after German institutions. Um, the School of Practical Forestry was um, founded by Carl Schenk, uh, in 1898, and it was on this Biltmore Estate, and it's around, uh, it's in western North Carolina, around the Asheville area, area and it's now the Cradle of Forestry. Um, the graduates uh, would be teamed up with western supervisors and rangers, and um, they really, this is where a lot of the ideas uh, came up on how to manage forests and how to, how to, how did it come up with real practical management of these areas? Because this Biltmore uh, estate was such a vast area that it really helped um, give them an idea of how to manage these large uh, land acreages that people were going to have to deal with once they left the school. So here's just some pictures that this house here in the top right, that's um, that's the uh, the um, lecture building uh, at the school, and uh, down at the bottom right, you can see one of the one of the graduating classes. And you can see um, one interesting thing, especially with the the times that we're living in these days, is to to notice the the lack of diversity, both both gender wise and and racially, uh, among the students, uh, because also uh, during this during this time we've got um, the idea that these people are going to go out west and they're going to go live out in these areas and be in these areas and um and be you know miles and miles away from people so there was only certain people who who wanted that experience or who were able to even um be privileged enough to have that experience and so it's it's um it's always a thing um, that I notice when watching these old forestry videos uh, that you see the same uh, the same type of people over and over and over again. So that takes us to uh, Teddy Roosevelt, who's also seen as another um, a huge champion of the environment, and so um, with Pinchot working and helping him out. Um, he's got, Roosevelt is aggressive in his support for the National Forest. Um, one of his big things was that he was, he noticed the Great Lakes region um, having problems with timber depletion. And so he's really big on in, coming up with uh, new inventory policies, providing states with infrastructure to be able to, to do some work, um, starting to collect grazing fees. And so under Roosevelt, the national forests um, or these fet the f um, forest reserves get brought up to um, 100 million acres. And then in 1907 under Roosevelt, they become national forests under the, the guise of the U.S. Forest Service. Um, in 1908, the Forest Service then breaks uh, into field districts, which they call regions now, and they've got about 15 to 20 national forests in the field that and field experiment stations for research within each of these regions. Uh, he also hosts a White House conference on natural resources and really just makes natural resources a priority, which makes sense for the time with the westward expansion. So now that gets us to um, back to this idea of national parks. So with national parks, they decide that they really want to protect these areas and these areas are to be set aside and they're just to be enjoyed by people but not to be um, used or depleted of their natural resources. So no grazing, no hunting, or no mining was allowed on these areas. And that was hard for some people because they can, some people who are settling out in the West feel like these are their areas and, you know, where they would uh, go in um, you know, basically get their livelihood from. So uh, Roosevelt had to even go as far as putting the cavalry in some places to um, keep people 
out of these national parks. And so now you've got these preservation areas. And then with the national forest, you have these conservation areas where you're supposed to be using these resources. And so this preservation versus conservation idea um, really comes to a head after the uh, large earthquake in San Francisco in 1906. So the, the people of San Francisco, the whole town, you've got this huge earthquake. You get these, a bunch of these fires because of the earthquake, and the whole town basically burns to the ground. And so because of this, San Francisco starts looking for water sources to make sure that this sort of thing doesn't happen again. Plus, it's, um, it's, uh, society is growing, so you got more people, you have this need for water, and they um, propose this, the damming of the Hetch Hetchy Valley in Yosemite. So a lot of people, because of um, the way Yosemite is set up now, if you've been up there, People talk about the beauty of the Yosemite Valley. Well, it used to be the, way back when, the Yosemite Valley and the Hetch Hetchy Valley. But um, this dam was um, was proposed. And um, the Sierra Club and John Muir, who existed at this time, were, um, were really against this idea. Because this area, this Hetch Hetchy Valley, is in the national park and John Muir being the naturalist that he is and being a friend of Roosevelt and um, and Pinchot can't understand why they want why they're okay with this um, but they were they saw it as as providing a great use for the people whereas Muir and the Sierra Club were much more about protecting um, these areas and so um, the conservation wins out uh, the Hetch Hetchy Valley uh, gets flooded and is still flooded to this day. And so now um, uh, this area basically is destroyed in the mind of uh, John Muir and the Sierra Club. And it really kind of sets off this environmental uh, schism that has existed for a long time where it's the, uh, the environmentalists versus the uh, conservation or the preservationists versus the conservationists, the people who want to use natural resources versus the people who say, no, you should, you got to protect them. And really, both of those groups care about the same thing. It's just, um, it's just the way that it went about um, was not done, um, not done uh, in a way that worked for, for the greatest good. Um, for in some people's minds um, and that led to the creation of the National Park Service in 1916 and one of the big things that they put in when they came about was that there were no dams allowed in national parks because technically there was no rule about that um, to begin with and that's why it was okay to um, propose this idea and so the the preservation versus conservation idea really um, really was something that just kind of irked some people. So John Muir, he was he was a preservationist and naturalist, and he wanted it set aside and unimpaired. Pinchot and Roosevelt uh, believed in conservation. They believed in sustainable use of natural resources. But um, this kind of, this created a schism. This split them apart. This put them on opposite sides of the fence. And... Um, down here in um, below this picture of the four of the Hetch Hetchy Valley and after once the dam has been put in um, is a link to a video um, which will uh, go into great detail about this difference um, between uh, preservation and conservation and the Hetch Hetchy Valley and what it what it used to be and what it is now. So then, uh, also still in the early 1900s, we have the Weeks Act under President Taft. And this is um, it's a really important act in that it helped provide for the creation of national forests east of the Mississippi. And so uh, it's a really smart act because um, this, people are still in this exploitation phase where they're cutting, cutting and leaving. So just taking all the resources they can, and then they're done with an area, and so they just they just take off and go to a different area. 
And so what the government decided was that they were going to buy these cutover lands or they were going to buy tax delinquent farmlands or eroded lands from people. And once they didn't want them anymore, or once they became tax delinquent, and by doing so, and having this understanding of ecology and knowing, well, these trees will grow back eventually if this land is managed correctly, this ended up leading to the creation of 52 national forests in 26 eastern states and basically getting the land back that they had given up um, to private landowners at one point in time to really help um, bolster the the national forests and bolster these timberland um areas that they could then um, have for for their use and so that that added um, 20 million acres of national forests across um, a bunch of states and uh, even puerto rico so um in trying to uh, put in the role of women during this time um, they were uh there were more women on the side of preservation um, during the the split between preservation and conservation. And the reason for that um, is the same thing um, we see in 1915, is that women weren't really um, allowed into the conversation. And so well, the places they were allowed into the conversation were, were these societies. So um, there were women in the Sierra Club and there were women in the Audubon Society and there were women in the National Parks Association. So these societies were a way for women to be able to try and get involved in the conversation, be able to get their voice or their opinion out there. And so it's um, these societies uh, are really, really important in helping kind of um, change the voice from just being one specific uh, side of things to, to at least opening up the conversation two more people. In 1924, we have the Clark McNary Act. So this makes it easier for the Forest Service to buy land from willing sellers within predetermined national forest boundaries. So um, the work of Pinchot and others, when they've gone out west and they've seen these areas, they've decided these are where the national forest should be well you still had settlers who were already out there and so what this basically the clark mcnary act did was make it so that um once these people um uh, were determined to ha be living within a national forest they um they were uh there was an easy process for them to then get um bought out from their land um it also uh established uh established better um better forest protection, especially in terms of fire control and water resources to try and protect the, the continuous production of timber. And then also uh, helping with um, the Department of Agriculture working with private forest landowners so that um, they could understand the process of reforestation and the process, uh, the basic ecological processes of not trying to destroy the land or leaving the land um, without cover on it and and learning how to um, how to take care of the land and make it the land sustainable and so it it's kind of begins to be the start of the process of how the government starts working with landowners in order to to manage these lands 